No. Let's get together to co-create a breakthrough for freedom of energy, sustenance, healing, and regeneration of the human vessel. Welcome to Physique, the Free Energy Special Interest Group, where science meets spirituality in the quest for truth and knowledge to free humanity and transform this planet into a paradise. No sound. Hi, everyone. Welcome to part two of the 95th Physic meeting. Today is the 1st of December, the first day of the month of December, very exciting month. So we have a very interesting speaker, uh, uh, the renowned Jason Wabelli speaking. Um, I think it's all right, Pontus, don't need to share screen. Oh okay. yeah, okay, since you shared it already, it's fine. Go to the, straight to the agenda, yeah. Uh, Lovely. Thank you, Pontus. This one? It's wonderful, yep. yes, yes. So, so um, this meeting, we only have one speaker because we had so many issues lately, you know, with the other subjects, the other topics, and we had uh, trolls, we've been attacked, we've been hacked. <laughs> so we thought, okay, since my microphone's not working too well, either bear with me because of the low bandwidth, we thought we'll just have Jason Wabelli speaking as the one and only speaker for the 95th meeting. Because he's, he's our VIP in the free energy community anyway. <laughs> and he's so knowledgeable and he could share so many things. So we broke the meeting into two parts, part one, part two. We just finished the first part. He, he, Jason had brought us through um, how uh, John Searle started, I mean, Searle started the, uh, his motor generator, the technology right from uh, the beginning and how he got involved and all that and how the technology works. And it's so interesting, folks. You must go back to the first part to see it all. And Jason certainly has got such beautiful, beautiful illustrations through the videos that he's got and the pictures and his preparation is superb. Thank you, Jason. So um, Jason is an independent investigator and researcher of unconventional technologies experimenting with exotic phenomenon, both electric and magnetic. He is committed to studying and applying the concept of magnetic waveforms and developing the unique magnetic materials. So, uh, and as president of SEG Magnetics, he, <laughs> he literally knows it at the back of his hand and what a presentation that was just now earlier. So folks go back to the first part, look at it all, and then come back to the second part that we're just about to start, where Jason will be speaking about the rebirth of classic physics, time, light, and gravity. Another very interesting subject. Uh, I think he touched uh, upon the anti-gravity side of things as well just now when he was explaining how the magnets work with the, the copper and uh, microgravity. And uh, he also touched a bit about the cymatic magnetism as well. So now in the second part, he will be elaborating a lot in more in details, okay? Magnetic waves combining cymatics with magnetism. As you know, you wanna know more about cymatics, go back to, uh, go to our YouTube channel and um, look up those uh, cymatic experts like Sean Picasic and, uh, and uh, David Schumacher. They were speaking at physics as well. So look at those videos as well. So I know, you know, it's so interesting to learn from this, this masters of the science and the technology together. We're going to make a difference, folks. So join us in every meeting that we've got. Pen down in your diary for our 96th physics meeting on the 5th of January. Thank you. Thank you, Pontus, for sharing this on the screen for me. <laughs> oh, really appreciate you, bro. So um, over to you, Jason. If you want to know more about Jason, because I did read out his bio in full in details, go to the first part. Over to you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I love you so much. You have a wonderful format. I love your introductions, and uh, I feel uh, very relaxed and and everybody here is, is great. This is awesome. Oh, we love you. We love you. Hey. We waited one year for you. <laughs> like this. I, hope it's, I hope it's worth it. So we got some even more uh, 
intense stuff to talk about in this next segment. Uh, this is something I am very passionate about, just as I am passionate about John Searle and the magnetic technology and the humanitarian applications to all of this in general. But educating people to proper models of science is, uh, it's absolutely unequivocally unparalleled necessity for people to have a broader understanding of what is going on in the cosmos, light, time, and gravity without needing relativity at all. Relativity was invented a hundred years ago to try and fill in the holes of classic physics because classic physics couldn't derive equations and make certain predictions at the time because there was a lot of flaws. So Einstein and uh, others uh, cleverly and deviously created an artifice and mathematical equivalent scenarios that happened to yield the proper answers. But by cheating, by creating mathematical fictions and adding things that don't exist into the equations to fill those holes to get the right answer. And a lot of people take math as being the end all be all. If you have an equation to describe something that must mean something is correct. Not if there are two different frameworks of mathematics that can get to the same answer, but completely conflict with each other. So I have been interested in the other credible alternatives to relativity because all we grow up with and everybody, everything knows, all of our movies, all of the science channels, the books, the universities, everything is worshiping relativity. And here's a presentation to give you a credible alternative from a man named Dr. Edward Dowdy, who passed away last year on December 31st. And unfortunately, I never got to shake his hand, but this guy is one of my heroes, like how Isaac Newton is a hero to people and like how Einstein is a hero. This guy should be known as the new Edward Dowdy, not the new Einstein. This guy is smarter than Einstein. This man has more qualifications than Einstein ever did. And he has the math and everything to back it up. So this presentation is called The Rebirth of Classic Physics, Time, Light, and Gravity. Based upon Galilean transformations, that's a mathematical framework, and the work of Dr. Edward Dowdy. So we got to get back to the basics when we talk about science because language, semantics, and terminology really makes a difference and it matters. But the scientific community has lost its way for the last hundred years. Proof is a mathematical equation. It's a derivation to show how you arrive to the solution and get your answer. Proof is a route to show how you got your mathematical answer. Evidence is information and data collected through experiments and observation. Proof and evidence are two different things, but people use the terms transitory as if they mean the same thing. A hypothesis is just a what if scenario. What if this is real? What if this? It's a hypothetical. And a theory is an explanation of that hypothetical scenario based within the framework and the rules of the math that you're using. And the math has specific rules and consequences. You can't deviate from it. So experiments never prove a theory. Observations never prove anything. Observations do not collect mathematical equations. Observations collect evidence. And then you can write equations to try and describe and explain that evidence later. But math can be completely conflicting, yet can describe the same scenario. So. We'll get back into that later. But all we see now are articles and documentaries. Relativity and Einstein proved again through this experiment, through this observation in the telescope. These people have lost their way in science and they have lost the scientific method of what it truly should be. So this is a difference between science and science. S-C-I-E-N-C-E -E versus P-S-Y. 
E-N-C-E. One of them is talking about real dynamics in our tangible reality. The other one is messing with your mind. So math is a language and a tool, but can also be deviously misused as while to create an artifice, something that doesn't really exist in reality, but it can be used to solve something. So people think math is the, is the best thing out there and nothing uh, can topple it, but other math can contradict other math. Relativity abides by Lorentz transformations, but classic physics uses Galilean transformations. And what Dr. Edward Doughty did, uh, he reformulated the classic physics equations under Galilean transformations so that it can answer and predict and do everything that relativity could do without needing actual relativity. So this is a credible opposing framework because in relativity, they say that mass increases the faster you go, that gravity is not a force. Gravity is the curvature of space time, they say. They say that time can shift and dilate and go faster or slower and be perceived subjectively. And that the speed of light, the velocity of light is the same to everybody, no matter where you are and how fast you're moving away or towards something. But this information says it's all of that is wrong and this shows the opposite scenario. So under this emissions theory, mass does not increase with velocity. Gravity is a force and an emission just like light. Time is constant and does not dilate despite what atomic clocks say. Velocity of light is dependent upon the velocity of the light source. So if somebody's holding a flashlight and running towards you, the light from that flashlight is traveling faster than the light if with somebody's running away from you. But Einstein said the light is the same no matter what. But this shows that it's different depending upon the, the source movement. And that source movement is called the constancy of light. And that is not required under this theory, but it is under relativity. So there's no requirement for any media to propagate light. Uh, before Einstein, even Nikola Tesla and all of these other people said there was an ether there's this luminiferous ether media between the planets and the rippling and disturbance of that ether is how light propagated. And the disturbance and deformation of that ether is what generates gravity. But after that was sort of dismantled in 1906 by Michelson Morley, Einstein was forced to scratch his head and say, okay, it, it, it isn't ether anymore. It's, uh, 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 it's the fourth dimension. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So he just pretty much renamed ether as the fourth dimension to try to save face for his theory that was being dismantled. So they started making up things that didn't exist in order to fill in the holes of that theory, like dilating the time and uh, mass increasing and decreasing with speeds. So I look at relativity like a toothpick bridge analogy. I consider relativity like the common core of physics. So it's like, it's, it's it's the toothpick bridge that spans across the Grand Canyon. And he, Einstein, amazingly built this toothpick bridge that is held together by the glue of all of these other scientific models. It happens to go a great distance and yield the predictions and solutions to some things. And it works until it doesn't work. And Dr. Edward Dowdy's method happens to work in all scenarios across the cosmos for everything, sound, light, electricity, gravity, everything. So Dr. Edward Dowdy, who was he? Most, one of the most brilliant men I've ever had the pleasure of studying. Uh, African-American gentleman who earned multiple degrees from uh, Hampton University and uh, uh, let's see, Bachelor of Science in Mathematics, Electronics Technology, and Bachelor of Science in, in Physics. He earned a, a diploma in atomic energy in Heidelberg, Germany. Uh, he had concentration of nuclear magnetic resonance and engineering and uh, observation of free atoms and ions in confined plasma vessels and plasma physics chambers like they do in Lawrence Livermore, but in Germany. Uh, he earned degrees in astrophysics and astronomy. He was a PhD holding profession in laser spectroscopy physics. He was an electrical engineer and retired from NASA and was also uh, 
a part of the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Atmospheres to study things like Venus. He built the laser systems to study the atmospheres of like Venus. He built the laser systems for NASA to study the polar ice caps. Uh, he was an incredibly qualified, brilliant individual. He was a university level professor of mathematics and taught at multiple universities like Lincoln, Cheney, Marymount, Southeastern and Howard University, as well as teaching people in Heidelberg in Germany with atomic physics. He was fluent in multiple languages of English, German, Spanish, and had an academic knowledge of French. He was a member of the American Physical Society and the Photonic Society uh, and lots of internationally recognized organizations. He has 16 peer reviewed papers and over 40 citations and references and publications to corroborate his claims and his, and his work. So this is not just some guy in his garage. This is one of the professionals, one of the skeptics themselves who retired from NASA and says, NASA has got their interpretations wrong. Stephen Hawking has everything wrong. Einstein has everything wrong, but he holds these people in very high regards and high respects. I myself do not. Uh, I think these people who have been promoting these false models should have like their diplomas burned, their citations eradicated from literature, all of their credibility and like credentials revoked, all of their books put in the fiction section and be retroactively forced to pay back any grant money or serve prison time for fraud. I think Stephen Hawking's body should be exhumed from Westminster Abbey and buried somewhere else because these people are not prestigious. They were not correct and they have held back humanity. We are living like the Flintstones instead of living like the Jetsons. Uh, so this man had a very high respect for Einstein. I don't as much, but we'll go into that later. So the history and comparisons of these models of why we should use these Galilean transformations and why should we even question relativity? So it's the scientific community's duty to scrutinize a model with such volumes of mathematical justification and all this experimental, experimental evidence and observation. Occam's razor says the simpler solution is most likely the correct one. Well, this guy has one page of mathematics that can describe what 15 pages of relativity have to do without using metric tensors, just using elementary math and geometry. So the importance of this guy's theory cannot be understated and must be taken into serious consideration by the community. He has unparalleled qualifications and his scientific contributions and recognition have earned the right for him to be heard. Unfortunately, he's deceased, so I'm gonna try to do him justice and convey his information. So the newcomers to his particular theory, you have to drop relativity, drop dark matter, drop black holes, drop space time, drop ether, drop time dilation. You have to get rid of everything that people hold dear even in hollywood movies like even in the day the earth stood still the alien goes into the guy's uh uh lab he starts erasing the dude's chalkboard right because the guy was subject to relativity what did he do he erased it and put something a lot better and in all these movies einstein is wrong and somebody comes along and gives something better well dr edgar dowdy is that guy it's time to listen to him so in relativity, they say light speed is a limit, but in classic physics, it's just a constant. It's not a limit. You can travel trillions of times faster, quadrillions of times faster than light, as long as you have the energy to do so. And that cannot happen in relativity. They say light speed is a limit. And once you go past that, you start messing with superposition. You could be in two places at the same time. And the faster you go, the slower time gets until time can go into reverse. Not the case with this theory. Time is an absolute constant to everybody throughout the cosmos. There is no universal now in relativity, but there is only now, universally, like the Buddha, like Buddha, like these ancient people are talking. There is only now, there is the one, and they're talking about the one reality that we all share simultaneously throughout the cosmos. We experience objectively together. But relativity says it's all experienced subjectively depending upon how fast you go or how big you are, small you are, or how far away you are. Uh, and it's disastrous to how we view the cosmos. 
the universe, according to relativity, and in in these things are 14 billion years old. And you're looking back in time. Uh, they say that space and time is linked, but according to classic physics, they're completely different and separate. Time is not a dimension whatsoever in classic physics. Gravity is a force. Gravity is not the curvature of space-time. Gravity propagates just like light. So anything light can do, gravity can do. You can focus light into a laser beam, into a spotlight. You can have different frequencies in a gravitational spectrum. But that's not possible in relativity because they just say it's the deformation of the fourth dimension itself. So the faster you go, the slower time gets in relativity. Not the case here. Uh, there is a fourth dimension in relativity, but there is no fourth dimension at all in classic physics. It's an invention. So this is a completely different approach. And there hasn't been a more important model like this since Isaac Newton and all of these highly, highly regarded people from hundreds of years ago. Dr. Edward Dowdy should be regarded as like one of the best scientific minds to ever, ever participate in the scientific community. Yeah. It's this is not to be overlooked. So this deals with a different model of light, like what Johann Goethe was talking about, where this Newtonian model of the prism that everybody knows, where you get the rainbow through the prism, that's only when you get it at one certain distance from the prism. But normally, it doesn't start out like that. It starts out completely different. So there's like uh, different scenario. That, if they have the model of light wrong from a prism, what else do they got wrong? So in relativity, they have space-time curvature, but in uh, classic physics, light refracts and just bends right at the surface of a star, not above a star, and there's no evidence to suggest that. In, cl in classic physics, time is a constant, and Dr. Edward Dowdy actually produces equations to back these models, where before there was no equations to say the alternative to time dilation and all of these other things. So this is an equivalent, an alternative to the invariance of the wave equation produced by Einstein, really plagiarized by Einstein. And here it, it says that reflection technically does not exist. Light does not bounce off of a mirror and ricochet off. It's more so that the electrons making up the glass of the mirror absorb that incoming light and then that incoming light diminishes to zero. And then there's a brand new light that is re-emitted from the glass of the mirror back out. Not that it's just a reflection of the same light. All of relativity, ether theory, holographic theory, string theory, quantum theory, simulation theory, and past emissions theories, all of them rely on the same light moving through something distorting, going through a prism, and then continuing on. That never happens. It's not the same light. And this one concept can change all of astrophysics, all of observational astronomy, and all of science. This one concept of absorption and re-emission, rather than the same light and the same electromagnetic energy distorting and continuing on. It doesn't happen. The, the light from the sun comes in the electrons making up the atmosphere of Earth absorb it, re-emit a brand new light. That secondary light hits your window. The electrons making up your window absorb that light, re-emit a brand new third light coming into your house. The air in your house absorbs that light, re-emits a brand new fifth light. It hits your eye. The atoms making up your eye absorb that light, re-emit a brand new sixth light into your eye, and then you interpret it. It's not the same light coming through and into your eyes. It is never the same light at any point of interference. And that is the main difference of this invariance of the wave equation to show that it is never the same light. It is always a brand new re-emission. And every re-emission is from a new frame of reference. So if you have a flashlight being pointed at a mirror, it's just not the same light bouncing back. It's a brand new light being re-emitted at a tangent. If that mirror is moving towards the, if, if that flashlight is moving towards the mirror or away from the mirror, you have to account for the speed of the flashlight moving towards the mirror and then add that to the speed of light itself in relation to the target. So Einstein said, 
if the velocity of light is even a tiny bit dependent upon the velocity of the light source, then my entire theory of relativity and gravitation is false. That was a quote in a letter to one of his uh, fellow zealots, uh, Edward Finley, Erwin Finley. And if the speed of light and the velocity of light changes 0.00000000001 bit, bit at all, Einstein's entire theory is wrong. So it turns out the speed of something traveling towards or away from you will determine the frequency and the wavelength of that thing being more or less. And there is indeed a difference. And Einstein was wrong. But the electrons making up yourself will reproduce a brand new light. So like the double slit experiment, when they send that light through the slit, it's not the same light going through the slits. Some of that light gets through, but then the border of the slits itself absorbs some of that light and reproduces a brand new light, which is on top of that original light. And then the detector is put in the path of that light and the electrons making up the detector itself reproduce yet another new light on top of that. And that produces the waveform and the interference pattern. It's not the collapse of the wave function. It's the manifestation of the wave function. Observation does not manifest reality whatsoever. It's the mere presence of the electrons of the observer that absorb the light and re-emit a brand new light on top of whatever light that's already existing that didn't get interfered with. So Jason, I, I, need, yeah. I need to interrupt a little. Of course, you feel free to share screen. <laughs> I, I know that you have a PowerPoint presentation on this subject, right? Feel free to share screen. Oh my God, it wasn't sharing the whole time. If, if, That's horrible, no wonder. If, Oh, okay, <laughs> you mean you meant yeah. to share, yeah. but you didn't. Oh, okay, oh, so that's oh. okay. So we can, we can, uh, people have the uh, link to this presentation. So they can go back over this stuff and look at the slides that I have gone over thus far. Which oh, is yes, not if you go through it very quickly, people can freeze Absolutely. the screen and watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Thank you. going back to the basics, we have the definitions that people should be following into the basics of science to actually assess a scenario, the difference between proof, evidence, hypothesis, and theory. Scientific community has lost its way and confused those meanings. The difference between science and science, PSY, one of them is messing with your mind, this is the difference between for, uh, mathematical frameworks. Two different mathematical frameworks can conflict, yet describe the same scenario that people can agree on, yet the interpretation can be completely different. So one of them is correct. The other one's just messing with your mind. This uh, is I'm sorry to interrupt again, Jason. Yeah, if you could <laughs> just uh, do a full screen share, because screen. it's too much, uh, it's too small. People uh, how do I... Uh, uh, how do I do the uh, full screen share here? Oh, maybe I can, uh, like my whole desktop, like that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, so much better. Thank you. Okay, yeah. cool. So I did in the center or something? Okay, so uh, here we go. Um, oh. No. Uh, try to make it bigger. Okay, hold on a second here. I can go. Yeah. Not like that. Mm -hmm. Getting better. We can read some now. There we go. Mm -hmm. This is my first time. Terribly sorry, folks. Oh, is it? Wow. It's good for a no, first I'm time. Just, no, I'm <laughs> acting like it's my first time. No, that's not good. Okay. So here we go. So getting back to the basics, proof, evidence, hypothesis, theory, experiments and observations never prove a theory. They only collect evidence of which then you could start describing using different methods of math. Some of those mathematical scenarios can conflict, yet they can describe the same scenario, which can confuse people into thinking that a given mathematical approach is the correct one. Even though it could yield the same scenario, it could be making things up that don't exist just to get to the right answer. And that's what relativity has done. Here is a uh, credible alternative to relativity to show the difference between Doppler shift and red shift which treats the same light and the same sound as distorting and deforming relative to an observer. But Dr. Edward Dowdy says, it is not the same light and not the same sound. It is being absorbed and re-emitted from a new frame of reference at a constant, which then serves the illusion that the original light and sound is deforming and distorting. And that is happening at the speed of light, 
So it serves the illusion that we're just seeing the same light bouncing. We're seeing the same light deflecting, going through a prism. It's not the same light. It's happening at a reciprocal sequence. The internal reflection is a brand new light. The light coming out the other side of a prism is a brand new light. But that whole process happens at the speed of light. So there's a constants and then there's constancy. There's two different things that people need to understand. The constant of light is not in question. The constancy of light, the speed in all frames of reference is what is in question. Relativity says it's the same. This theory says it is different. Relativity invented methods to get to the right answer, like the perihelion of Mercury, binary pulsar PSR 1913 and 1916, and other technical scenarios in physics that only relativity could solve at the time. So you got to have to give relativity credit for that because nobody had encountered using an artifice and making things up mathematically on paper that just so happened to work and actually predict things in reality. But they took those analogies and mathematical fictions as literal. And so here we are with everybody worshiping relativity with things that are not real, but they treat as real. So using relativity to try to get to these solutions is like building a toothpick bridge across the Grand Canyon. But we have a airport on either side of the Grand Canyon now, which is equivalent to Dr. Dowdy's reformulations. So you don't need to walk across this rickety toothpick bridge with glue that's being used from different models to hold it together. Dr. Edward Dowdy was a brilliant, uh, very credible, voluminous involved individual with the scientific community who, had, uh, who was overqualified much more so than Einstein ever was. Einstein was a patent clerk who plagiarized a lot of stuff. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but Einstein married his cousin. You know that? Dude couldn't even tie his shoes, married his cousin, and people think he's a genius. Me, not so much. I'm sorry. Comb your hair, Einstein. Okay, so we got history and comparisons. Why should we question relativity? Well, because there's justification to do so now. Before, things just might have been crackpot theories and, you know, might – have fractions of the answers, but this guy reformulated classic physics itself with equations that are undeniable and work out in a much easier manner than relativity. And if something can be yielded in a much easier fashion, why would you want to go through more extraneous methods with 15 pages to solve something you can do in half a page or one page? So let's listen to this guy who has an easier method. In relativity, there is no universal now. But in classic physics, there is only now, universally. Light speed is a limit and a constant in relativity. Space and time are linked. Time is a location and is the fourth dimension in relativity. Light follows the curvature of space-time. The curvature of space-time is gravity. Gravity is not a force, according to relativity. Gravity is instantaneous between bodies in relativity. Yet people who study relativity say, no, it's not. So they try to take aspects of classic physics and apply it to relativity when really it doesn't apply and they use different aspects inappropriately trying to save face for their failed theory. So anybody in relativity should not be using the phrase gravitational force since Einstein said gravity is not a force, but yet these people in university levels are still using these phrases which are uh, misnomers. So in relativity, a 3D mass displaces a 4D fabric, like how you sit in a bathtub and the water level rises simultaneously as you sit in the volume of water. They say that is how gravity behaves in relativity. A 3D mass is displacing the fourth dimension and it's the curvature of space-time. And if you just blow up that planet, then that curvature of space-time, like a bowling ball on a mattress, you just get rid of the bowling ball, the mattress will just boing, recoil right back into flatness again. So to me, relativity is even worse than people who believe the earth is flat because these people believe space is flat. I call them flat spacers. That's crazy. Believing that space bends around the curvature of dense objects must mean they believe that space is flat between those dense objects. And uh, even Nikola Tesla refused to believe that, uh, that notion. So in relativity, they think time is the fourth dimension, but in classic physics, there is no fourth dimension. There is only 3D Euclidean geometry 
X, Y, and Z axis. Gravity propagates just like light as an expanding sphere uh, at the rate of C. Uh, the faster you go in relativity, the slower time goes. But in reality, the faster you go, the faster you arrive at your destination. In reality, that's pretty much it. Time cannot dilate in classic physics. There is an illusion having to do with the electrons making up atomic clocks, and we'll get into that later. So there is no other more important scientific model than what Dr. Edward Dowdy has presented. And in order to talk about gravity and so-called anti-gravity, we first have to understand light. Light is misunderstood because people, first of all, use the Newtonian prism model. And really, Johann Goethe was a guy who developed a much more accurate prism model. There is no curvature of space. Light does not bend around curvature of space-time, but rather light refracts and deflects at and re-emits at the boundary of a star. There is uh, no universal time in relativity, but there is in classic physics. But until now, there was no proper equation, but there is because of Dr. Doughty. Time is the same in all frames of reference. T apostrophe equals T. T, T apostrophe is time in another frame of reference equals time in another frame of reference. So time is the same no matter what to everybody. Reflection technically does not exist. It's not the same light ricocheting and bouncing off of a mirror. It's a brand new light at every point of ricochet and alleged interference. You are the absorber, the observer, the detector, the sensor is always measuring a re-emitted waveform. It's never the original light. And that secondary waveform that's being measured is always traveling relative to the observer and relative to the detector. Therefore, the illusion is that the light is traveling at the same speed to everybody. But it's not because the electrons making up yourself re-emit a brand new light that you're seeing. All the light you ever see is the re-emitted light from the electrons making up yourself. All the gravity you ever experience is the re-emitted gravity from the electrons making up yourself. So when light goes through a window, the electrons absorb it and re-emit a brand new light into your eye. It's not the same light. And if you uh, zoom in onto the, your eye, you'd see that it's the electrons absorbing and re-emitting and that's what your brain is actually processing, which is also why things are inverted because you're measuring the inverse of the re-emission. So it's everything's backwards and upside down many times. So that's the illusion is that the sensors only detect the re-emitted light from the nearest source. And the nearest source is the electrons making up yourself. So everybody is only detecting their own light and their own gravity. So imagine you're encased in glass. You can only measure the refractive index of the media surrounding you. Uh, you can never, ever measure the velocity of a primary source ever because it, it's re-emitted by the time you measure it. And as Einstein said, if the velocity of light is even a tiny bit dependent upon the velocity of the light source, then his entire theory of relativity and gravitation is false. So there is a way to relook and reinterpret everything that relativity says is valid and validates it. You can look at all that same information actually invalidates relativity. So if a flashlight is moving towards a mirror at a given speed, you have to add that speed to the speed of light. Or if it's traveling away, you subtract it. Likewise, if you're traveling on a train towards a target and you fire a bullet, let's say you're standing still at the target on a range. You fire a, a bullet at the target. The bullet leaves the gun at the speed of light, let's say. Okay, but now let's get on a train and start moving towards the target. The bullet is leaving the gun at the speed of light, but now you have to account for your traveling towards the target on the train too. So the speed of light plus your velocity going towards or away from the target. And that is not accounted for in relativity. They say, don't even pay attention to that. So that is to do with the frames of reference, but light does not behave like bullets. There is no particle wave duality. There is, light is neither a particle nor a wave. Light is a constant from its source. And it's only until the electrons making up anything else absorb and re-emit that energy that a waveform develops and then you can measure the frequency of interference between that source and absorber. So like there are no waves in between planets. There's seemingly nothing until it gets to the boundary of the atmosphere making up Earth and then the light is produced at the boundary of Earth. 
the energy leaves the sun, Earth absorbs it and re-emits a brand new light. It's not reflecting. Same with the moon. The moon absorbs the energy from the sun and re-emits a brand new light from the dust making up the Earth's surface. It's not reflecting the same light. So all the light you see is the re-emitted light from the electrons and all the gravity you experience is the re-emitted gravity from the electrons. Electrostatic attraction and repulsion, magnetic attraction and repulsion, eddy currents, centrifugal force, Casimir force, acceleration, all of that simulate the effects of gravity, but none of those things are gravity. Gravity is not electric. Light is not electric. Yet light and gravity is emitted by electrons, which by definition is electricity. So there is the illusion is that even though light and gravity is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum, light and gravity itself is not electric. And there is no direct correlation between electromagnetism and gravity. There's no direct interaction rather. And that is what the qu quantum loop gravity and, uh, and relativity and all of these articles and all of these scientific models are futilely trying to bridge a unification model or a theory of everything and a theory of one, trying to bridge quantum mechanics with relativity, trying to figure out how gravity operates on the quantum scale versus the macro scale. And it's nothing like what they think because they think it's the curvature of space time, but you have to have a lot of mass to do that. And on the quantum scale, you don't have a lot of mass, so therefore you can't have the gravity, but it must loop. And it's just crazy talk. So rather than looking at it through Einstein's you know, rose-colored glasses, we could take a look at a different alternative in that the electrons making up something are re-emitting the gravity. So if something is really, really small, it absorbs the gravity from the sun, but it can only re-emit so much gravity unto itself. Anything floating in space in microgravity, because there's no such thing as zero gravity, even in space, there's microgravity. But like these forces behave the same on any different, any given scale. So I put this video together, a couple of them on YouTube, uh, relativity versus classic physics. So we can uh, see the difference in the alternatives in the history of how these models came to be uh, rather than just regurgitating and parroting the same information from a textbook and and Einstein, which, you know, even Einstein said, repeating your actions, expecting different results is insanity. So the scientific community has been doing the same thing for a hundred years, trying to bridge quantum mechanics with the relativity, trying to figure out how it works on the quantum scale, but it just doesn't do so. Gravity is not dependent upon that. It's an emission just like light. So uh, I have this linked here, but those are like 25 minute videos. You can look on your own time later. So do you think gravity is instantaneous? Yes or no? You got to pick one. Gravity is not a force if you think it is. Like sitting in a bathtub, the gravity of the fourth dimension is displaced, and then that's it happens instantly. So if there's a big sun that comes into the galaxy or the solar system, it's going to affect everything simultaneously, they say. That's the relativity model. Yet they're trying to figure out how it could possibly be like ripples in an ether between planets. So they're trying to have this war in the scientific community, whether they think it's the displacement of a media, like sitting in a bathtub versus patting the top of the bathtub water and sending ripples. Fourth dimension doesn't have a meniscus and a surface to it. So they're trying to apply aspects of classic physics using condensed matter to describe the fourth dimension. And it's inappropriate. And they're confusing the hell out of people for over a hundred years. And it's wrong. So gravity is a force. It has a delay. And I put this video together. Uh, I think it'd be cool to just watch it's four minutes. I'm just taking a break from some machining. But uh, relativity says that there is space time and space time is flat with no mass present. There's mass present, space time curves. The curvature of space time is equal to gravity. Light bends around the curvature of space time. And uh, if there is an explosion of that body, that space-time would just boom, go flat instantly, if not have some sort of a little rebound or a recoil. That's not real, though. So the claim for general relativity is that gravity gets cut off in real time, instantaneous. Explosion here, instantaneous recoil of the 
uh, of the space-time curvature back to flat again, which means all of the planets orbiting around the sun, if that sun exploded, according to the general relativity, all the planets would immediately go flying off into space, yet the planets would still observe the sun in the location, spinning around, looping in the sky just fine. That doesn't really make sense. So classic physics says there is no space-time, that uh, time is the same from all frames of reference. Reality is linked to time. You can't change reality or the perspective of time, even through the cosmos, from all frames of reference. We are already orbiting a Berry Center. We're already offset, so the Earth is not orbiting exactly the center of the Sun. It's orbiting uh, 20.5 arc seconds off. So the Sun is actually, the Earth is orbiting the Sun where it was 8.33 minutes ago. So there is an offset and delay of the signals propagating from the sun to the planets. And there's a delay from the gravity propagating from the sun to the planets. And if the sun exploded, we would all see the explosion happen in real time, but we wouldn't feel its effects and that shock wave wouldn't reach us for 8.33 minutes. Not that the sun would explode, space time curvature would flatten and then everything would fly away instantly. No, it would take time for that wave of destruction to propagate out at the speed of light. And that would take 8.33 minutes from here. But if that happened at the center of our galaxy, it would take 13,000 light years for that wave of destruction to happen. And if that active galactic nuclei is still there, then we just continue orbiting. And if it isn't there, then we'd continue orbiting as if it was already there until that wave of destruction reaches us. So... That's kind of what that says. Okay, so there is, it's claimed that there is a black hole at the center of every galaxy, and that is what is generating the gravity where everything is orbiting around. And some galaxies, they can see a very bright center. Some galaxies, they can't see much of anything in the center. So they assume there must be a black hole in the center of every galaxy. But in this particular model, Gravity has a delay. So if the center of a galaxy blows up, all of the stars will still continue to orbit where that star used to be for another million years or so. So if you happen to look in that amount of time, you're going to see all of those stars orbiting nothing. And then you're going to wonder why are those stars orbiting what seems to be a dense body, but we can't figure out where it is. It's because it's not there anymore. It used to be there, but the gravity that already left that star is still affecting those orbiting bodies. Play a speaker. Now turn off the speaker. The sound that already left the speaker will continue to travel out, even if you turn the speaker off and even if you smash the speaker and destroy it. The sound that already left will continue to reverberate. Same applies to the light and gravity that leaves a star. So Earth is orbiting where the sun used to be 8.33 minutes ago. Not that we're orbiting the center of the curvature of space-time like a divot in a mattress. That just doesn't even work even when you use it as a model physically. So under Lorentz transformations and relativity, it is a mathematical requirement to have a fourth dimension or an ether or something like sitting in a bathtub and the water level affects everything simultaneously. There must be some media in between planets, according to Lorentz transformations. That is the consequence of that mathematical framework. So they invent dark matter. They try to figure out how in the hell are all of these planets and the atoms being held together when we can't see what the heck is holding them together. It's because some things have already expired, yet its influence is still propagating and affecting things. And you can't see it because it's been long gone for thousands of years. But they think something must currently be there. So this is like, okay, so let's go into, oh, I forgot the last slide. So sound, light, gravity, and all electromagnetic radiation propagates as an expanding sphere. That sphere expands from a point at the speed of light in all directions. It doesn't become a wave until the boundary and the edge of that sphere 
is absorbed by the electrons making up anything else. And then you get that waveform because those electrons can only absorb so much before they start to re-emit and then they absorb more and re-emit, absorb in a sine wave according to the refractive index of the media. So there is no waves between planets. It's absorbed, it's generated at the boundary. All waveforms, all massless energy propagates like an expanding sphere. But under Galilean transformations in classic physics, you don't need any water. You don't need any ether. You don't need any fourth dimension in order for light to expand, in order for gravity to expand and affect things. That requirement is only under Lorentz. And this man, John Stuart Reed, is who I consider one of the masters of cymatics. And he developed this sound bubble wave model and shows the shape of sound, which is actually a sphere. And all cymatic patterns are really a cross section of a 3D image. If you were to vibrate some colored dye in water and you vibrate the glass of water, you'll see that cymatic pattern forms a 3D image. But people are normally accustomed to seeing a sand on a flat plate. So they only see a 2D representation, a cross section of that image. Likewise, with these expanding spheres, it's like Russian nesting dolls. When something absorbs this incoming constant energy, it will form spheres and layers of energy according to a wave. But there is no wave in between planets. It only happens at the point of absorption. So when what you're looking at here is a screenshot of an older uh, video of a failed rocket launch in Norway called the Norway Spiral. People thought it was a UFO. It was a failed rocket launch. What you're seeing is an out of control rocket moving away from the camera. So let's see if I can go here too. There you go. This is a CGI representation of what the actual Norway Spiral was happening. So the uh, rocket is, okay, so light a cigarette, trace a circle in the air with your cigarette. Now walk forward at a constant rate while tracing the circle with the cigarette. The smoke will form a corkscrew in your wake. So if you're up in the upper atmosphere and there's nothing to really disturb that smoke, it's going to form a perfect spiral because the back end of that rocket is circling at a constant rate, traveling forward at a constant rate. Therefore, it's producing a corkscrew at a really cool looking geometric spiral. Uh, and then the smoke is ionized and then you're having it illuminated by the lights below. So it just looks like a really cool portal. And then after the, the fuel from the rocket is gone, you see this black circle start to grow. Well, you're just looking through the smoke. Now you're able to see the night sky. So the back end of that waveform, you see the first initial sphere of light being growing from that point. But when it stops, what do you see? You see the back end, the concave portion of that wave end. So the wave front is spherical and convex, but the wave end is concave. So if a star puts out its first light in gravity, it will take the speed of light and the distance between the two points until it affects it. And it will continue to affect it at a constant from then on until the source stops emitting the gravity and then the back end of that emission will take the speed of light and the distance before the things are uh, stopped from their orbit. So that's spherical wave fronts and concave wave ends, gravity and light and sound all behave the, the same, but you normally can't see the shape. So when you talk about gravity with people, people normally talk about what gravity does, not what gravity is. No one denies that when you jump up and you indeed come back down to the ground, but it's the mechanism that's not understood of how that happens. Isaac Newton never claimed to have a theory for the cause of gravity. He developed the mathematical proofs and calculus to describe the behavior of matter and energy inside of a gravitational field, which then has a gradient and drops off according to the invert, just like light, just like sound, just like electricity, gravity has a drop off. So Einstein was quoted saying, I have not as yet been able to discover the reason for these properties of gravity from phenomena, and I do not form any hypothesis. So, I, so Newton described the effects of gravity, but never came up with a cause. Einstein said gravity is not a force 
and defined gravity as the curvature of space-time itself, like the deformation of a fourth-dimensional media, treating the fourth dimension itself as a physical surface of water, of which every point in space is a surface of water. It's like, okay, Aini. Uh, so there is no attraction or pull in relativity. It's inappropriate for supporters of relativity to use the phrase gravitational force or model any pull. There is no suction in space. Gravity is the displacement of a media according to relativity, but it's not in reality. Casimir force is a real phenomenon where you have two parallel plates or two things so close to we get so close together that the energy between those plates, that zero point energy, will produce or rather will cancel out some of those waveforms in between the plates. What happens is that you have more waveforms on the outside of the plates. More on the outside and less on the inside means the outside will push towards the end. So initially, scientists thought there was an infinite amount of dark matter accumulating between the plates to pull them together because they couldn't figure out how they were being pulled together. But the plates are not being pulled together from the inside. They're being pushed together from the outside from all of the other forces and frequencies that are, are there. On the inside of the plates, there is less frequencies. Therefore, they will be pushed together. So gravity is a push, not a pull. And Georges Lesage had this model of push gravity hundreds of years ago. And this uh, video by See the Pattern on YouTube is a great expose on that concept. And I had that linked in the article. Another guy, Walter C. Wright, wrote a book about gravity is a push as well. And Dr. Eugene Podklednov, who worked with NASA and the Russian government to try to validate John Searle's claims, and Boeing tried to validate it with uh, Eugene Podklednov with these rotating superconductors, he found that the colder this gets in a vacuum when spinning at really big speeds with high voltage, 90 degrees to a magnetic field, that it will produce some anomalous gravitational force that can reduce the weight of things. And the government craft called the TR-3B is claimed to utilize something just like this where it has a hollow donut with a mercury-like ferrofluid. They spin it inside the hollow donut. The superconductive-like fluid generates a gravitational field from the convection and magnetic forces, and it will lift off and reduce about 85% of the weight of the craft. And Boeing was really interested in this. And when NASA tried to duplicate this with Dr. Podklednov, they lost their funding and ran out of funding before they even got to turn on their unit to test it. The Department of Defense came in and confiscated all the equipment because they didn't pay their dues because they ran out of funding. And and then Boeing and all of the and NASA and people started saying, yep, the, the tests failed. There was nothing to see here. No, nope, it's all wrong. Uh, they set everything up to do it. And before NASA got to actually do the test, they confiscated everything and then claimed it didn't work. Well, you can't fail a test that you don't take. And you can't violate what doesn't apply. So there are major similarities between the math that Dr. Dowdy is talking about, the experiments of these rotating superconductors, and the so-called anti-gravity phenomenon. I don't like the term anti-gravity because the term anti suggests a canceling of gravity. John Searle liked to use the term inverse gravity, but he treated gravity like a flipping of polarity, like magnet, like, uh, like electrostatics or magnets. But I look at it differently like it's an emission and it's just a, a, a different dynamic altogether. Walter Russell was one of my uh, favorite uh, researchers before I found Edward Doughty. And Walter Russell said that light and heat does not travel from the sun, but rather it is reciprocated and reproduced in space at each point, which to me, sounds like a more esoteric way of saying light does not, the same light does not travel, but rather is re-emitted from media to media. He said light does not travel, it is reproduced from wave field to wave field. So that just is more esoteric uh, way of saying the same thing that Dr. Edward Doughty is, is professing. And in this model, 
photons and gravitons are neither a particle nor a wave. They are a constant stimulus that becomes a waveform once encountering the electrons making up something else. So a photon is a massless spherical emission expanding at the rate of C, according to Huygens' principle with those expanding nested spheres. And a gravity is photons. Is a, light is photons, gravity is gravitons. It's the same uh, process, but different types of energies propagating the same way at the speed of light. A particle is what something is, not what something does. A wave is what something does, not what something is. Gravity has a spectrum, just like light. A primary gravity can be absorbed and a secondary gravity re-emitted like a reflection or an echo. Gravity has wavelengths and frequencies and propagates like light at the rate of C. It has a delay and an offset and an aberration effect. Gravity can be focused like a spotlight or even a laser, I think. And gravity is a force. All the light you ever see is the re-emitted light from the electrons making up yourself. All the gravity you ever experience is the re-emitted gravity, re gravity from the electrons making up yourself. So you don't have to worry about the gravity of the earth or the sun or the weight of the world, Atlas. You ultimately only need to worry about yourself. And here are some technical equations having to do with the, I guess, induction of gravity from one particle to the next without need for any media between. So this is supplied by Dr. Edward Doughty in dealing with uh, gravitation and electrodynamics in Euclidean space. And it's a uh, very simple math, not simple concept because we are so tainted with relativity, it's difficult to understand this in relation. But once you gain a grasp on this, it's quite easy to understand. And if you were to grow up with this understanding rather than relativity, you would look at relativity like just some nonsensical Hollywood fiction movie, which it is. So do not be fooled by these incoming ball particles of gravitons. That is just to denote the direction of the emissions. It should really show like spheres or half spheres growing downwards towards the ground, but it's just to denote the, the direction of the energy incoming to the earth. So the earth is sort of orbiting and rotating and cutting through all of this energy that is being emitted by the sun. But by the time earth cuts through that energy, the sun has shifted in the sky 8.33 minutes. So we're picking up the uh, re-emissions of the sun from 8.33 minutes ago. And you can tell uh, which direction it's going and how much the gravity is uh, influencing Earth by these uh, glass classic physics equations. And all of these are supplied by Dr. Edward Doughty. And the entire scientific community needs to stop what it's doing and take a look at these brilliant, eloquent equations that are undeniable, that happen to work and are a more simple approach than what relativity offers. Relativity says that gravity bends light, but gravity does not affect light at all. On the left is what relativity and Eddington says that we should see. Now, Eddington was a guy during May 29th, 1919, he measured the solar eclipse during that day to validate relativity. And here's an experiment that can prove relativity again. And that's where it all started. It was May 29th, 1919. But people don't realize that there was a second team in Brazil that was also looking at the solar eclipse from a different angle and their values they concluded was like a straw bending in water. It was the result of refraction, had nothing to do with gravity. But by the next day on May 30th, 1919, news articles and newspapers were already being printed saying that Einstein was proven correct and, and hailed true without even going over the data from the second team of Eddington's own team. And they were screaming, saying, wait a second, why are you doing releasing these articles? That's in completely incorrect. What are you doing? You're, you're sort of getting ahead of yourselves, guys. But it was too late. The entire scientific community took it as true. And overnight, Einstein was proven to be correct because of the solar eclipse. But it has nothing to do with gravity. Gravity has all of these equations to describe be uh, the bending of light 
farther and farther away from a body, the more dense it is. But light only bends at the boundary and the very meniscus and surface of a star and a body. It does not bend above the star. And they have all of these equations to describe that, but only one of the equations is correct. The rest of them is just mathematic. It's an artifice and wile and guile. It's made up nonsense that happens to work out on paper and works out for their simulations. But that's what astrophysics has become now. It's a cult of computer simulations. Observational astronomy deals with what is actually observed through telescopes and what we can measure. But astrophysics now deals with computer simulations. And if what they see through the telescope is different than their computer simulation, they say reality is wrong. What the? So here's more videos that I have of this brilliant man putting together from NASA, by the way, all of their own data showing the light is not bending the way that they suggest. The What we see and what they say and simulate is completely different. So light does not bend from gravity at all. So what they claim and relativity is on the left and what we actually see is what's happening on the right. Even through 14 years of observations at the Max Planck Institute, looking at this alleged black hole at Sagittarius A, they see stars are orbiting something. Like clearly they're orbiting something, but they're orbiting nothing. So there must be something there, they say. But nope. It used to be there and the gravity is still affecting it. But according to relativity, we should see these stars distort their light and create all these Einstein rings, they say. But not one of them has ever been observed in real time. They, they, NASA will pick and choose screenshots and still images to try and tout that their theories are correct, but they will never show you the images in motion because it does not look like what they say distorted space geometry looks like at all. It looks like on the right, Euclidean space geometry, no distortion at all. So there's something wrong with their theories. This is what's calculated versus actually measured, what they predict versus what's observed, what they think should be versus what is, their fourth dimensional nonsense versus what we see in 3D reality, their Lorentz approach versus Galilean approach, relativity versus reality. And here's the actual image over 14 years. They took picture after picture after picture over the course of 14 years of these stars orbiting something, and they don't know what it is. So on the left is what they say we should see with this distorted light. But does anybody here see that? No, it's just ball of light changing direction. No distortion in reality. So they will never show you a time resolved in motion like see, series of these events. This is what they show you on Wikipedia. This is what they show people. These alleged gravitational lensing images, which is just lens flare, forward light scatter, and camera artifacts, and flaws of the satellite itself. That has nothing to do with gravity bending the light. They will never show these things in the satellites producing picture, 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 picture while in motion because this thing just does not show up. And it only, these, Artifacts only show up in X-ray, microwave, or radio. They never show up in the visible light spectrum and other spectra. So they constantly have to show these still images to say, see, we're proved right again. The observation proves relativity. Yet you can look at the same observation and interpret it in completely different ways. That's refraction of the lens of the satellite itself. That's it nothing to do with gravity bending light. So this is, it's the people who are in charge of these observatories, they either know this and are purposefully keeping this information from people, at which point it's purposeful fraud, they should be put in prison, or it's just complete gross negligence. There is no in-between. So what should they be fired for? Idiocy or fraud? So these false alarms on lensing, again, Dr. Dowdy has provided the equations for the deflection and re-emission of light at any given size star and density and the proper equations for how it should bend. He said, the scientists who support relativity are either unaware of this phenomenon or they don't want you to know about this. This is bad news for them. According to relativity, light bending should be everywhere you have gravity, but gravitation exists around an object that doesn't have plasma, the light should still bend according to relativity, but that does not happen in reality. 
And you can find out a lot more through his website, Extinction Shift Principle, extinctionshift.com and his book. So this goes another illusion here. Magnetism does not affect light. But here we see you can plainly observe that this guy's holding a magnet and he brings it closer to this crook's tube and you can see the light bending, right? No, the light is not bending. What you're seeing is charged particles being emitted from the left and going to the right. When the magnet is in next to those particles, the particles start changing their direction. The particles are glowing. It's not the light that bends in an arc. It's the particles that are bending in an arc and the particles are glowing. So therefore you see the path of the charged particles producing bending, but light is not bending. That's the illusion. But here you can plainly see that it's bending, right? And you can develop an entire th set of mathematics to show how the magnet bends the light, but it does not. If you do that same experiment with a laser pointer, it's not gonna do anything because magnetism doesn't affect light and neither does gravity. It's only the plasma and the atmosphere around a star right at that point where the light will bend. So what is gravity? A lot of people describe what gravity does, but nobody really describes what it is. So I try to just, let's, let's give it a definition. Gravity is an emission propagating at C at the speed of light. Gravity is a force. Gravity is emitted, absorbed, and re-emitted by electrons. Gravity is the result from high energy particles, constant rate of change at a constant. Ratios of coherence versus incoherence, the rate of change, that triangle symbol, rate of change of accelerating and decelerating potentials and gradients, like undulating. Wow, wow, wow. That's how you get the repeating waveforms. You have to have something undulating, pulsating, spinning, orbiting, a rate of change at a given uh, rate. The same light and gravity does not come from the sun and affect Earth. By the time it reaches Earth, the primaries are absorbed and re emitted by the Earth itself, and then subsequently re emitted by the electrons making up you. Any photons in the visible spectrum produce the property of illumination. Any gravity within a certain spectral range will produce the property and illusion of attraction. The more atoms present, which means more electrons, which gives a false impression that mass itself is the cause, but really it's the electrons surrounding the mass. Electrons are electric in nature, electrostatic potential with a gradient, not orbiting particles. Light is emitted by electrons, yet light itself is not electric, electric and the same applies to gravity. Gravity is not electric, Yet the high voltage discharge of like UFOs, exotic craft and UAPs will serve the illusion that gravity itself is electric, but it's not. There is no direct link between gravitation and electromagnetism, only indirect, just like the magnet changing the path of the magnets here in the, in the light and the, it's not the magnet doing it directly. It's an indirect uh, uh, effect. So that's why there can be no bridging of quantum and relativity in these gravity theories because there is no direct link between electromagnetism and gravity. It's only indirect. So, so they're, yeah, they're trying to bridge the unification of mutually exclusive and diametrically opposed mathematical frameworks that just, they don't work. One of them is talking about reality. One of them is a made up scenario. You can't bridge them. Some fundamentals that actually lead to emissions of gravity and producing gravity are mimicking and simulating a high pressure state, which generates extreme order, extreme rotation and speeds, extreme voltages and superconductivity, extreme pulses and rates of change at a constant. Asymmetric, uneven, absorption to dissipation of electrons. So you're absorbing more electrons than you're putting out. If you are putting out more electrons than you're absorbing, that means you're getting hot. You're going to have a nuclear meltdown. But if you're absorbing more electrons than you're emitting, you're going to have a superconductive overload. And that's what leads to emissions of gravity. The reason why I have these hexagons here in the uh, model of the sun is because that's what the makeup of the sun is like. The sun is not made of a ball of gas held together by gravity. The sun is mainly made of liquid metallic hydrogen. When you compress a gas enough, with enough pressure, it becomes a liquid. You know that old, uh, that old riddle? Uh, what if a unmovable object encounters an unstoppable force? You know, what happens? 
Well, a phase transition, apparently, because liquid metallic hydrogen is a state of hydrogen that is so condensed under so much pressure, it is incompressible by definition. So if you try to compress the liquid hydrogen, it will turn into a liquid metal. What is a metal? A metal is a substance that has its atoms scrunched so close together that they share the electrons throughout the entire lattice of the material. So the hydrogen is pressed together so much that it forms a liquid metal, liquid metallic hydrogen, and it flows in convection currents, which then produce these massive solar magnetic fields. Because normally if you heat up iron, to 850 degrees Fahrenheit, it loses its magnetic quality. So how is something like the sun, 3 million degrees, producing a magnetic field when there's no iron? It's just a ball of gas, right? No, you have a superconductive liquid metal flowing. And when metal flows, it generates a magnetic field and electric potentials. So the makeup of metallic hydrogen is like a hexagon like graphene. And graphene and graphite appears black, which is why sunspots and coronal holes appear black because we're looking through the actual bright atmosphere of the sun and seeing the real condensed matter liquid ocean, metallic hydrogen surface of the sun. But mainstream science says there is no surface to a sun. There is no condensed matter. There is no liquids or solids in the sun at all. And the sun does not even have a surface, they say. Any surface you think you see it's just an illusion, and don't trust your lying eyes, they say. <laughs> These folks, I tell you. So, if a high-pressure state scrunches these atoms together until they are evenly spaced, evenly everything, all the energy is perfectly coherent, then if you consciously manufacture something like nanotechnology to be evenly spaced, the same size, the same distance, the, everything together as one, then you're going to reap the effects as if it is in a high pressure state, as if it's in the center of the sun. So that's why nano, uh, nanotubes and, uh, and graphene is so much more electrically conductive than even copper. Carbon is normally not conductive. Like you have a coal or you have a diamond, but if you break it apart and evenly separate it on the nano scale, you'll have a chain link fence of carbon, which will be much more electrically conductive than copper. So what if you do that with hydrogen? Hydrogen itself will form a metallic lattice and produce a superconductive star. And that's the, the, the model of the star is incorrect from relativity. They think it's a ball of, ball of gas, 100% gaseous plasma held together by gravity. But when you look at it like, a liquid metal, you don't say the metal molten sphere is held together by gravity. You say it coheres together. So there's different laws of physics within reality that we can describe these same things. And if you have more electrons than coming in than going out, you can have these effects. And if you have something like John Searle, who has what? Evenly spaced magnets, evenly spaced materials, the same density, the same size, the same weight, the traveling the same direction, the same speed, pulsing all together with the same magnetizations. Everything is one doing what? It's simulating a high pressure state and generating all of these effects, satisfying all of these requirements for these exotic behaviors. And John Searle was able to do that as a child he was a savant and a prodigy, so well brilliant. They hired him as a supervisor for the largest electric plant that ran all of London. While he was there, he put together his device and took it home and it worked better than expected. It had a superconductive overload. The more energy he tried to draw went to his ceiling because nobody taught him that wasn't supposed to happen. And it just so, and I have a video on, the, the specific physics as to the electron absorption and, and re-emission and the lifting effect onto the UFOs and why I think it happens because it's analogous to a negative mass. Electrons behave completely differently than protons and everything, even if you treat the electron as a ball particle model. It's said to behave completely different than all other mass and matter. So if like something is spinning to the right, they say electrons are going to the left. If something 
is weighed down, they say electrons will just accelerate up. Everything is opposite. So wait a minute. If everything is opposite, wouldn't that be like negative mass? But wait, that's a that's a no-no to talk about in science. And I agree. I don't think negative mass exists. But I think electrons can be interpreted to have the equivalence of negative mass as if negative mass is present. So if you have a bunch of protons together with no electrons there, you're going to have a nuclear meltdown. The thing is going to heat up. But if you have a bunch of electrons there, it's going to cool down and go, go to an overload and then lift off the ground. So an accumulation and condensation of electrons, which isn't even a thing in mainstream, can lead to a conductor rising off and repelling from the ground. Like if you have a bunch of impurities in a volume of water, oh, real quick, this this uh, a science daily article about negative mass and high speed, how electrons go their own ways to try to justify some of this stance that electrons behave as negative mass or analogous to it. So if you if you have a balloon in a car and let's say you have a let's say you have a pendulum or bowling ball hanging from the ceiling of your car when you accelerate the bowling ball will go back just like you are pressed into your seat. So if you have a helium balloon in your car and you accelerate the helium balloon will go forward in the car. Let's see here. So here's a pendulum hanging. Here's Destin from Smarter Every Day accelerating. And of course, the inertia pushes the pendulum back. But negative mass would behave opposite. So as you accelerate forward, the pendulum would go forward in the direction of acceleration. Why? Because all of the air and the weight of the air that's in the car is heavier than the helium. So the weight of the air goes to the back of the car, which then does what? Pushes the helium balloon to the front. So... If you have a bunch of impurities in a volume of water and you have nanobubbles in the water, bubbles are not attracted to the surface. Bubbles are pushed to the surface because the weight of the water is more than what's inside the bubble. So the bubble is pushed to the surface. I think it's a similar, a similar uh, effect with UFOs lifting is that there's an accumulation of electrons, which is analogous to bubbles attaching to the surface of something underwater. And the more bubbles that attach to it, the more it will become buoyant and it will rise to the surface to try to equalize that potential. But the bubbles aren't attracted to the surface and anything hitching a ride on the bubbles is not attracted to the surface. It's just being pushed away. So a UFO, if it is in a superconductive state, will be pushed up and away by the magnetic field of the earth and all of the positive forces that are near the surface of the earth. It wants to become in a negative state. So it will try to equalize its potential and be pushed away to that state. So the more electrons that are compressed, the lighter the system gets. But it's not like the system loses weight. It's being lifted up with all of its weight. So again, just like those plates that wanted to come together and the scientists initially thought there was dark matter accumulating between them to attract the plates together. When a superconductor or a magnet re repels and lifts off of the surface and levitates, they initially thought there must be an accumulation of dark matter that is pushing that away from the surface and that the magnet must be losing weight in order to rise above the surface. And then when it heats up again, it gains its weight back and that's why it floats back down. No, the forces are lifting the weight, all of it at the same time. Every bit of matter in space is weightless unto itself. Weight is a property measured between two or more bodies within an overall gravitational field. So something, can weigh more or less depending on where it is, you know, in relation to something like on the moon or on Mars, you weigh less. So in under Galilean transformation, mass is a constant. And under relativity, they say mass shifts and gains and, and gets less. Uh, and relativity uh, predicted the perihelion of Mercury by suggesting that Mercury is gaining mass and losing mass with its orbit around the sun. 
And that's how he was able to accurately predict the orbit and perihelion of Mercury and the difference of this orbit by suggesting that, well, the mass must be fluctuating. But there is no mass fluctuation in reality. You can say that on paper to achieve the correct answer, but in reality, mass is the same. But it's the forces surrounding that mass that are accelerating and undulating and going up and down, fooling you, serving the illusion that it's the mass that is undulating. No, it's the forces that are changing, not the mass. So that is a major discrepancy between relativity and Galilean transformations is that they say mass fluctuates, but this says no. Reality, mass does not fluctuate. All of these Hollywood movies and relativity and are looking to have warp drive like Star Trek, but there's nothing to warp. There is no media. There is no fourth dimension. There's no ether. There is no media between planets to ripple or to warp to generate that. You don't need to warp reality to travel faster than light because light does not have a speed limit. So they have to invent these warp drive theories in order to bend some media that they think must exist in between the planets. In order to travel faster than light, you have to deform that media somehow. And aliens can do that, so that's how they can do it. And when they do that, they go back in time. That's Einstein. No, you just... Go faster in reality. There's no uh, mass increase with velocity. According to special relativity, if you go 0.9% the speed of light, they say that you start to grow in size and weight the faster you go. You gain mass with speed and velocity, they say, because their mathematical approach requires that to happen. But under this uh, theory, and explanation, mass remains the same. You do not need to fluctuate the mass. And the reason why they say that is because inside a particle accelerator, they can't look with their eyes at atoms traveling near the speed of light and determine if you know those particles are uh, growing and shrinking. So what they measure is resistance of those particles traveling in that particle accelerator. The more power that they ramp up, the harder it is for those particles to achieve the, to get faster and faster. They can't go to light speed because the walls of the chamber itself are re-emitting the energy back onto the particle, creating resistance. There are no particle chamber walls in the open cosmos of space. So they're trying to apply a closed system scenario with resistance in their chamber to the open system cosmos. And they're trying to say that you can't achieve the speed of light because we can't get our particles to do that in our particle accelerator chamber. So therefore nothing can do that. Yet the emissions from quasars already disprove that notion, but they try to sweep that under the rug through relativistic warping space time nonsense. So here we have Dr. Edward Dowdy giving an alternative to effective mass rather than relativistic mass. So mass does not increase and decrease with speed. It remains a constant and the forces around the mass are what undulate, accelerate, or decelerate, serving the illusion that the mass itself is what is doing that because they're measuring the electrons around the mass. And if the electrons are absorbing and emitting, they will be serving the illusion that that is what the mass itself is doing. So relativity is really just ether and 4D. Ether was proposed to try and explain how light propagates between planets over great distances. Then they thought a 3D mass was like displacing a volume of water, like a luminiferous ether. But that displacement is simultaneous and instant, and gravity is not instant. So they were trying to figure out how a ripple could be instant when it's not. So the errors in their assumption that any media is actually required to propagate light and gravity. Around 1911, the 3D ether media was replaced by 4D space time because Einstein was proved wrong through uh, fringe experiments, fringe pattern experiments of uh, Michelson Morley. And Dayton Miller tried to do this uh, in an open system experiment in a high elevation and said he got different results. So Dayton Miller said there is an ether. And Michelson Morley says there is not an ether, but both of them were wrong because they interpreted the interference patterns incorrectly, thinking it is the same light shifting. It's not the same light. It's being re-emitted. And reinterpreting these 
experiments like that gives you an entirely new new light <laughs> on the scenario on how to interpret what is going on. So uh, here is his actual very detailed equations dealing with the uh, re-emissions of Doppler shift and the fringe patterns and nullified experiments and optics, which if you want to get into that, we, that's another very technical, very high level talk. Uh, but you can read more about that in this uh, Steemit article on my Steemit page of which we are looking at right now. So this is one of my favorite parts uh, that is the most difficult for people to try to grasp uh, and has the greatest consequences across the scientific spectra. Do you think time is relative? Everybody is taught that time is relative. We all are growing up with relativity and uh, shackled with the tainted thoughts under the filter of relativity. So do you think time is relative? If you think time is relative, that reality is subjective. Everything the Hubble sat satellite has imaged is in the past, equal to the distance it takes light to travel. So if a galaxy is a million light years away, they say we're looking one million years into the past. If you think reality is subjective, then reality then you subject uh, you subscribe to relativity and ether theories and Lorentz transformations. You think time is connected to light, gravity, distance, size, and acceleration. You think that a photon is a packet of reality that unfolds like the frames of a Hollywood movie, dependent upon the order by which they hit you. And if you travel faster than the rate at which those frames of reality can be sent, then you can travel through time, says Einstein, because Einstein judges reality by the face of a clock. He said, let's define time by what clocks measure. So if you have two clocks, one at sea level and one at Mount Everest, and they tick at different rates, Einstein says reality must be experienced subjectively between those two points, must be different. So he has this uh, space time and that time shifts in different frame of reference while the velocity of light remains the same for everybody. But in classic physics and under Edward Doughty's perspective, reality is objective. You do not manifest reality by what you look at. Your thoughts do not manifest what everybody is objectively in experiencing. Everything the Hubble satellite has imaged was happening in real time as it was captured. According to classic physics and effectivity under Galilean transformations, time and reality is an independent of light, gravity, distance, size, acceleration. Doesn't matter how fast you're going, how far you are, what size you are. If you're traveling faster than the speed of light, your gravitational source, nothing. Therefore, yeah. Uh, the uh, pep lemon. We got lemon pepper, barbecue, barbecue hot. Oh, lemon pepper. <laughs> lemon pepper tendies? Like AMC? It's fixed. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, wait. I like lemon pepper tendies. All right. <laughs> so anyway, uh, there we go. So time is not relative. Uh, a photon is a spherical massless emission that illuminates reality as it is in real time. Time is a universal constant. We experience the one reality together. The totality of reality is not judged by the face of a clock, Einstein. Time is a measure of reality. But GPS shows that the electron configuration around atoms deforms at different altitudes, like how the moon affects the tides. And that will register a different tick rate of an atomic clock. So if you judge reality by itself, by the decay of an atomic clock, and two atomic clocks are registering different times, then you're going to think reality itself is subjective between those points. And then you see the difference in time ticking between those clocks, and you'll say, relativity is proven yet again. But really, it's just showing that the electrons are deforming around the clock and you're measuring that, not time itself is deforming. So this deals with real time, not space time. And here, the velocity of light is what shifts in different frames of reference and time is constant to everyone. And here's the difference of the equations. So again, the moon affects the electrons around atoms, just like how the moon affects the tides of the earth. And that is not accounted for in atomic clocks. And if somebody is traveling east to west or west to east, then you're going to have a different rate of time depending. And there's just a lot of technical illusions that are fooling the world into thinking that relativity is valid and that time dilation is a thing when it's not. Even one of the leading experts of GPS, the guy who helped invent GPS himself, 
Ron Hatch. Uh, he's a 50 year expert and recognized even on gps.gov. You can go look at the government website and see that they acknowledge his 50 years expertise and said he authored a, a book that uh, was called Escape from Einstein, trying to detail how GPS has nothing to do with relativity. And that is touted as one of the greatest validations of relativity. Well, well, bro. Your phone wouldn't work without Einstein, brah. Uh, well, <laughs> apparently it can, brah, because this has nothing to do with relativity. It's an illusion of the electrons making up the source and the absorber. So the, the information alleged being transmitted between the two points doesn't deform. It doesn't dilate. Yet the signals and the time it takes does dilate, they claim. So there's a discrepancy. So if they are sending a signal, you would figure the signal would be deformed and then it would go faster as the gravity goes more or less. That's not what happens. The time is affected between the two points, but the transmitted data is not affected in a delay at all. So there's a discrepancy there that is being swept under the rug. And here he just goes through very detailed equations at the misconceptions of an atomic clock and uh, the electrons making up the clocks and how to reinterpret that entire scenario with real time rather than space time. So Einstein thought that the velocity of light was the same to everyone no matter what while time shifts, but it's the exact opposite. Time is the same to everyone no matter what while the velocity of light shifts. If a star is one light year away and the star puts out its first light, it will take one year before you see a flash of light like that sphere of light grows and the edge of that sphere reaches you after one year, boom, you're going to see a flash of light. And then all of a sudden you'll be able to observe that location in real time. Not that you'll look at the location one year in the past. It will simply take one year before the properties of illumination allow you to see in real time. So you'll just see a flash and then you can see in real time. So the Hubble telescope is collecting all of this light and then thinking it's looking back 14 billion years. No, it's looking right now in real time. So that's a major discrepancy. And people are having a lot of trouble to, to get that. And I understand why. Because the speed of light still takes time to transmit, but every point in space is already illuminated by starlight. So every point we're looking at in space is happening in real time. So if a star explodes, they could be looking in a location and receiving radio signals from something that is gone a million years ago. Yet when they look in that location, they attribute those radio signals to something they can see right now. But those signals being sent are millions of years old, but what they see is in real time. So they're trying to correlate what they see with what they hear, thinking it's all old and all the same light with dilated time. And everything is just completely whack in astrophysics. It's just, they have the age of the universe wrong. They have everything wrong. And here we have the more links to do with the atomic clocks and very professional articles written by professionals in their field dealing with this stuff, not just some crazy guy on, on a blog radio. <laughs> so an, an analogy is like looking at a volcanic explosion from a, a distance away. The history of the volcanic explosion is not contained within the shock wave. It's just that all of a sudden you'll hear a boom once that shock wave hits you, you're not going to relive the order by which the event took place within the shock wave. You're just getting a wave front, boom. That, and then whatever happened during that time, you missed. So if that shock wave was of light and the volcano was darkness, you know, it would take some time and a delay before that wave reached you. And then you would see all of a sudden the volcano in mid-destruction. You would not see back in time when it initially put out the light. It's just you're able to see what's happening now. Uh, so we're not looking into the past when we see stars and galaxies. So, so Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. I don't believe that. And if imagination is truly more important than knowledge, then let's use that same mental gymnastics to imagine the notion that time is constant to everyone throughout the cosmos, no matter what. Rather than stretch logic like space-time, 
let's think critically as to how it would be possible for everything we observe to be happening in real time right now. In order to visualize how it works, you got to drop relativity, the fourth dimension, Lorentz, space time, and all that. And what are the consequences if time truly is constant? Uh, it means that everybody's wrong. Everybody who's ever received a Nobel Prize or a degree from that stuff needs to burn it. They need to be pointed and laughed out of the scientific community, ostracized and banished for life. And leave the science to the real people who have been swept under the rug for the last hundred years. Light does not host information as if reality itself is broadcast by celestial bodies. We're not looking back in time 1.25 seconds when we observe the moon, even though it takes 1.25 seconds for light to reach Earth from the moon. We're not looking back in time 8.33 minutes when we see the sun. We're not looking back in time a million years when we see a galaxy a million light years away. Reality itself is not a transmission. Reality does not propagate. Reality is not a signal. Time is a measure of reality. You do not experience reality subjectively as if a photon is a packet being broadcast by stars. Velocity does not affect objective reality. You'll simply arrive at your destination faster. Transmissions and signals emitted by stars within the one reality will have a delay. So we already went over that. They could be attributing the signals of what they hear with what they see through Hubble and the difference in time could be millions of years sometimes. So that's just very confusing and that would be, uh, that's just awful for them. Uh, so space and time are not linked. Time is not the fourth dimension at all. And I put this other article together uh, called Twin Paradox Fallacy, Time Misconceptions and Faster Than Light Communication, uh, which deals with uh, the you know, misconceptions of time and the, and the time dilation. Uh, let's say you have two twins. One of them leaves for 30 years and then comes back. Let's say both twins, before they leave, they start reciting the same mantra. And they say the same mantra at the same time, at the same pace, you know, and then they both leave for 30 years. When they come back and they meet each other, they will have said the same number of mantras with the same timing, yet their two clocks will be years off and they will look drastically different. Why? Because one of them on earth is decaying and getting older at, you know, de their body is decomposing and oxidizing at a faster rate than the guy in space traveling at light speed or away for 30 years. There's the same amount of time, but one of them will look older because one of them will oxidize faster at the same age. Not that they will be older and one of them will be dilated more. There's no twin paradox. It's not, it doesn't exist. They will have said the same number of mantras. And when Elon Musk establishes a base on Mars, we will be able to observe these type of discrepancies between Earth and Mars. And it will probably be swept under the rug and uh, attributed to something else to validate relativity. Disgusting. So imagine it like two apples picked from the same tree at the same time. One apple goes into the freezer and is vacuum packed. One apple is left out into the sun. And after like 30 days, the two apples are brought back to each other. One of them looks really old and the other one looks pretty young, but yet they're the same age still. There was no time dilation between them. Just one of the apples was better preserved and didn't oxidize as much than the other. So that's like if you're traveling at those speeds at the like the velocity of light or greater, you'll have an excess of electrons, which prevents you from oxidizing and aging at the same rate. Indeed, you still age at the same rate, but you won't look like it, which will fool people into thinking that the twins are older when they're really not. And here is more math to deal with the motion of a source to the extinguishing of the source and uh, the emissions thereof and the time lack of dilation thereof. And I have all of these other diagrams that I want to eventually turn into uh, 3D animations and do my own simulations to try to accurately depict these dynamics in 3D so that they can be put side by side uh, to the relativity interpretation and split screen so that you can see the discrepancies between the two models and which one makes more sense and people can naturally lean towards whichever one they like most. But this deals with, you have two laser pointers like a long distance away from two observers. Uh, 
the red light and the blue light, but one one beam, uh, one laser pointer rather, is traveling really fast towards the observer, but they both turn on at the same time in the distance. One light will be observed faster than the other one, even though Einstein says they would be the same. So there are different tests that we can do uh, once we establish a base on, you know, in between Mars and the Earth. And so we, we got a ways to go, but we can substantiate this stuff mathematically through observation and through experiment directly. Uh, I, I think it's like semaphore flags. Like if you have somebody on a, on a Navy ship and they're too far away to, you know, to yell at each other. So they have flags to communicate what's going on, right? They don't need to use a uh, radio because that might be uh, detected. So they use flags to try to send messages to each other over great distances. Well, imagine doing that over really great distances through telescopes. You could see in real time, if you were able to look through a telescope at an astronaut on Mars and ask him a yes or no question, you could be looking through a telescope and he can hold up a sign that says yes or no. And you would see that message in real time, three minutes faster than it would take the video transmission and audio to be sent from Mars to Earth. What you see is happening in real time. But if they want to send a recording it will take three minutes at the speed of light to travel from Mars to the Earth. But if you're actually able to look through a real telescope, you'll see in real time, like a, a, a bad Chinese subtitled movie, you'll see the astronauts doing things in real time with their mouths moving, but you won't get that transmission for three more minutes. Yet everything you're seeing them do is happening in real time. Major discrepancy for relativity. Relativity says you're looking back in time, but nope. If you look, you will see in real time, yet the transmissions will have a delay. And if you're judging reality by the transmissions, you will be fooled. And that's what, they, that's what they're doing. So you can actually communicate with people faster than light, faster than the radio transmissions, if you were able to have direct line sight and wave flags or have signs writing on it, what you see would happen in real time faster than the transmission. And that can be validated. So I want to leave off with uh, some meaningful quotes, even one from Einstein. The condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. So saying something is false and, uh, and esoteric without even taking a look is quite ill-advised and as, as wise as we could do. So here's some really nice quotes. Uh, also, the difference between indoctrination and propaganda versus education from truefacts.org, the comparisons. Uh, we live in a, uh, a, a world that su supplies a school system, not an education system. And a lot of times peer reviews are viewed again as the end all be all. So if somebody has peer reviews, they must be correct. And if you don't have peer reviews, then you're not to be listened to. Well, a lot of the people who have peer reviews are wrong, and it's become a, a, a pat on the back, trophy handing, and group think session. So a bunch of people who think the same way give each other Nobel Prizes and are allowed to have the peer reviews. And if you say something different or present good enough argument against it, they will not allow for your peer review to be, for, to be reviewed. Not everybody is your peer. So the people who are judging reality through Lorentz and through these outdated models should not be partial to judging these opposing models through Galilean transformations. They say, nope, it's, you shouldn't even look at it because it just doesn't work. Yeah, according to relativity, but you got to drop relativity and think about it through a new light. And uh, again, Dowdy has a lot of uh, peer reviews. So if you want to be a skeptic, he has the peer reviews, but at the same time, the peer reviews has become a, a racket and a ring. And uh, unfortunately, Jeffrey Epstein had a lot of pull and influence with peer review rings and the Nobel Society. A lot of these scientists uh, that promote the Relativity theory and the gravity theory, according to relativity, just so happened to be great buddies with Jeffrey Epstein. Isn't that interesting? Jeffrey Epstein actually held a science conference at his Epstein Island 
with 21 scientists to define gravity under relativity. And if you don't agree, that you get no prize, you get no peer review time, you get no observ observatory time, you get blackballed and cut off. And a lot of people don't realize that Jeffrey Epstein had that kind of pull with the Nobel Society. And I don't know about you folks, but I would rather get my scientific models from people who aren't buddies with Epstein. So here is a lot of cooperating uh, uh, evidence and citations and references from Dr. Dowdy a lot more links and material, and of course, his brilliant book, which details all of this uh, to a nerdy degree. We love it. The Extinction Shift Principle. Uh, you can find that on Kindle or uh, try to get a hard copy through extinctionshift.com, the website directly. So there's a lot more, a lot more. Uh, oh yeah, one of the peer reviews was his seven, Dr. Dowdy's 17th peer review was uh, rejected. They wouldn't even read it because this because one of the uh, referees of the review said, nope, there's nothing to see here. It's wrong. And he looked at it through Lorentz. But he didn't even pay attention because it had to do with microwaves, not even the, a visible light spectrum. And normally, when somebody reviews your paper or rejects it, they must put their name and their source as the person who refereed it. But this guy refused to put his name and they just rejected his paper without putting any referee name. So it's uh, quite interesting. And again, here's some evidence of uh, the Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, here's an article, a couple articles and segments written. Uh, yeah, Jeffrey Epstein has the mind of a physicist, Harvard mathematician. It's like one of our own buddies and like he's so knowledgeable in gravity. So if they praise Epstein, they get Nobel Prizes. And people, that's what they did. So not everybody who has gotten a Nobel Prize is prestigious. It's not a prestigious prize anymore. It's like pats on the back and can be total shams now. Uh, so there's no dark matter. There's no black holes. There's, you could look at relativity completely differently. Don't need it at all. And to all the people who believe that science is a consensus or who think the science is settled, I present you with Galileo's preserved middle finger. And then on the left, you see a compass and how relativity says reality works, but how reality actually works, we all know is a little different. So they say, don't question me. Don't question relativity. And uh, let's see if we can get this little meme here. Oh, one second. Did we lose it? Oh, well, my uh, my screen share is uh, is lacking at the end there, but just had a, a quick fun thing of relativity. A meme shows uh, uh, don't question relativity or else uh, you won't get your degree. And then finally the guy. Oh, here we go. Don't question me. Don't question this book. Writes his papers. Why I don't question anything. Gives his dissertation. And that's why I never questioned it. And he gets his diploma, Ph.D. in relativity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Per uh, sometimes PhD stands for permanent head damage, but not all the time. <laughs> so we could be living like the Jetsons, but instead we're living like the Flintstones. Uh, here's a, a little comparison from John Searle talking about his, uh, uh, his the fields of the SEG, which just so happened to look just like the so-called Higgs field, which was presented a few years ago. But John was talking about these things long, long time ago. So we got... Uh, all this info and thank you so much for considering me and the information. I know it's a lot of crazy stuff to, to grasp, but uh, we can get through it. And I'm glad to answer any questions for free, of course, at any time, not just during this uh, presentation. So I don't think we have too much time for questions now. You've answered all the questions through your detailed presentation because <laughs> it's coming to two hours now and we won't be able to publish it on Odyssey if uh, it won't yeah, mirror. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Library L R B Y and Odyssey. We like those archives. L -B uh, oh, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's Odyssey. Change to Odyssey, right? No, change to. Yeah, I don't know. It's the same. It's the same. 
Yeah, we are on BitChute as well, folks. Okay, so go go and uh, sign up, subscribe. Okay, so I won't be long-winded. I just wanted to say thank you so much, Jason. Wow, I mean, this is so amazing. We don't want to interrupt you. I, I just let you go on and on because it's so full of stuff that we love to hear and know and learn from you. Thank you. It must have taken you months to research all that and to put it all together. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And a thank you to all of the tech to keeping this uh, going through the through the web stream and, and everything. That's that's a lot of work and stressful stuff. So thank you to all the listeners and everybody who participated. I love you all. And I, I can't wait to talk about this more because there's a lot more. Oh, we love you. We will have you back, Jason, one of those days. Yeah, we, we have we have meetings once a month, and that is uh, public meetings like this, the first Wednesday of the month, okay? So uh, you see, everybody's doing an on-call now in chat. More, yes, Maria. <laughs> uh, Mona is saying, yeah, and Maria Mai and everyone. I mean, we do have a lot of notables here in the in the audience right now. So uh, we they're really appreciating you and thanking you. Um, wow, this is so amazing. Even our coach, Fres, is very, very quiet. <laughs> I can't get a word in edgewise, Crystal, but that's it's okay. <laughs> So much information cram in and Pontus is smiling there on the side. <laughs> and even James is very quiet as well. But anyway, folks, we don't have time. So we really got to close. And uh, please, I ask of you to go once, uh, check, check, no, subscribe, subscribe with uh, our other channels as well, bitch, because we don't know, it's, it's very shaky right now, but if you could write, because we have two strikes and one more strike, that it, that's it, our half a million views is going to go down the drain and our whole channel will be removed from YouTube. So I really, I really put it out to you. If you want us to stay up, please, do, let's do a petition here, write to YouTube and tell them this is an educational channel for God's sake. Don't give us any more strike and remove all those strikes. I don't know how you did it, James, but you're amazing, James. I mean, you're a super soldier talk. You're still standing there with YouTube. But uh, you know what? Uh, also we remember really the hard. website Rumble. Rumble is the, uh, another YouTube alternative. Yeah, but we don't we don't have paid staff here. We are all volunteers, and I I really work my back off to, to make this possible. And now YouTube's going to be so nasty, you know, all the strikes. I know. <laughs> okay, folks. Um, there being no other business now, this ninety fifth physic meeting is adjourned to the ninety sixth meeting. And is it on the 5th of January? Yeah, that's it. So pen that down in your diary. And thank you so much, Jason. You're amazing. Amazing. We love you. Thank you. Right. That's it. We can stop recording now.